we are, I'm going to remind you of some of the announcements and it's also on the bulletin board. One of them is the Coffee Fellowship. I was just looking this morning on the Coffee Fellowship and I see no sign up for next week. I implore you to get your name on that board. Sign up for the Coffee Fellowship that when we're finished here, we can go downstairs and we can have a wonderful time. And you know that Jesus is, you know, they call Jesus the person who is always eating and, you know, fellowship. Food is, is an intricate part of it. You know, we need to have food when we're fellowshipping. So, sign up for your coffee fellowship. And the Sentinel, we, is it every week now? Yes. Every week, we, you know, we can go to the Sentinel to present the gospel to those who are there who cannot come to a place like this. Now, if you want to sign up, see Pastor <coughs> Sean right over there. And the nursery. We're also looking for help in the nursery too, right? Yes, so the nursery, that, and uh, the Kingdom um, Leadership Conference, that will be Saturday, April the 1st. I've seen quite a few names up there. So if you're available to go to this, um, today is the last day of Sunday. So if you're planning on going, get your name on the board. And uh, the next one is, I, I, I was looking up there, and it's the first time I've seen it. Maybe you noticed it was on the board for a long time. It's Mission Trips. And I was reading it, and... Say something. No. The mission trips, which is, um, I think you had someone who he, that came here, you know, uh, speaking about the mission trips that's going to be taking place April 8th, yeah, yeah, by multiple dates. It's April the 8th to the 15th and July the 20th, I think it's the 28th to August the 5th and October, and in October, and the cost is $1,000. $200, and I think that um, it has to do with the trip to Mexico, and they're, you know, they're trying to um, get people from here to go to Mexico to, um, to help out, to spread the word, and so on. So if you're interested, you know, I was looking at it because I would like to go. <laughs> so that, you know, you can take a look at it, it's all on the, the board. And um, it says that the Easter lily, March 26, I think it's the, for you to order, it's the deadline for that. So, you know, just let, let us look at all these things. Next important thing, birthdays. I see here that there's a one birthday uh, today, and it's Miriam, I don't know that person, it's Miriam. Oh, she's not here? Oh, okay. Otherwise, we'll be singing her happy birthday this morning. <laughs> As it's her birthday. It's her birthday. So, this morning, you know, we are having our worship service here at 10. And it's a repeat of ne for next week. It's the same. Sunday school at 9. <coughs> adults, junior high, and half. And we also have the women having their, their Bible class out there, too. Mondays for men at 9 a.m., and Mondays for the pastor's office, 3 p.m. The Wednesday, Wednesday is the associate pastor, which is our brother Sean. And that's at 6, from 3.30 to 6.30 p.m. I know these announcements are taking up a lot of time. So Wednesday, 6.30, prior time. And uh, Joy Club. Tuesday is March 28th. 10 a.m., we have a trustees meeting. Now, the meeting is really early in the morning, it's 10 a.m., so I don't know if all the trustees are going to be able to make it. I know my wife is not going to be able to make it. And that's, that's very early, it's 10 a.m. in the morning. Thursday, March the 30th, at 10 a.m., you have the women's Bible study. And then, the big one, Sunday, April the 2nd, Palm Sunday 
right? And it's a breakfast after worship service. And after that day, it says that baby bottles starts to benefit alpha pregnancy care. And then on Thursday, April the 6th, is the, yeah, it's the Monday, Thursday, Cedar dinner and service with, uh, with the communion. And you are required to sign up. And um, Kingdom Builders Conference, as I say, is April 1st. And the pastor is challenging you to read Acts 5 before the final Sunday in March. These are, are some of the announcements. And uh, I'm looking here to see if there is any more announcement. And if there is any, that's coming from the congregation. Is there any more announcement? And if you're a visitor here this morning, it says that if you are visiting us today, please fill out the welcome card in the rack on the pew and drop it in the offering plate as it passes. If you would like to speak with the pastor or other staff member, please know it's on the card. We hope you enjoy the time of worship with us today and would like to serve you in any way. So if there's any no other announcement, we will just read a call to worship, and it's taken from Matthew 22, chapter 22, 32 to 33. And here we read, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. This is the word of the Lord. And the congregation says, Amen. Amen. So, we would like you to take your hymnal right now and turn to M413. And the title of that song is, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. That's 413.
calling, calling, mercy is showing. If you do not know him, come, come, he is calling. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, I'm still pretending it's St. Patrick's Day. Okay. Um, and in the thought of St. Patrick's Day, uh, one of the things that came to my attention several years ago, and last year we had, I believe, Lisa read it, and she's going to read it again, is something that's called either the Prayer of St. Patrick or the Breastplate of St. Patrick. He wrote this, probably recited it many times. I think it's a very powerful and very moving prayer. Uh, that's what he said to come and read it for us this morning. Lord, and be with him as he recovers from uh, 
the stent that seemed to have given him some problems here over the weekend. Uh, or for those others who are not here this morning, we know that a couple kids are sick. That seems to be the time of year for kids to go into school and come home with something to share and uh, not the kind of things we would like them to share. So for those who are down with that, we pray that you be with them and uh, get them to recover. Don't let their parents get sick and lose work and you know, lose, just have life disrupted as it tends to be when kids are sick. So we put all those things before you, Lord. And we look around us, Father, and we see the chaos and destruction and carnage of our world. And, and Father, we don't know exactly what you have in mind or the time frame in which you have it in mind. But Lord, we can assume from Scripture that our times on earth, the time of earth, that may be coming to a close, although people have been seeing that for a couple centuries, a couple thousand years actually, they've been seeing destruction and wondering, Lord, are you coming now? Are you coming soon? And Lord, we still look for you to come. We look for you to come gloriously. Bring your kingdom to earth. And Father, as we look forward to that, we ask that you to give us strength, give us patience. Whatever our understanding of the scriptures are, in places that we may not be certain, we pray that you will give us surety that you are in charge and you limit the powers of darkness. Everything that will be done will be done under your sovereignty. So, Father, I put these things before you this morning. I also put before you the many nations that are in conflict. I think of Russia and Ukraine this morning. I think of Syria and Turkey with the uh, earthquake. That's still causing many problems. Our, our own missionary, Jeff Butler, has had some involvement there in distributing aid, and we ask you to continue to be with Jeff and his family as they work there. We ask you to be with our other missionaries around the world. Uh, we ask you to be with the Serbies uh, in Asia and keep them safe. Uh, and let their ministry, their clinic work well. Spread your gospel as well as giving healing, in particularly in the eyes of the people there. And Father, now we ask your blessing on this service, the rest of the time that we have together uh, to share your word, to sing your praises, all the things that go on in this, we ask that it be done in your honor and glory. And now as we turn to you and give a portion of the gifts you've given us back to you in our offering time, I pray that you will bless the gifts, bless the givers, and let the gifts be used well and wisely here in this congregation or wherever it tends to go from here. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning again, Saints. Good morning. For our oh, one and only praise and worship song, the title of it is, Is Mercy Is More. And I'm very sure you're experiencing that every single day. <laughs>
just I'll read the text and then I'll get into the message after I pray. Uh, talking about the the lame man here. It says, While they clung to Peter and John, all the people utterly astounded ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God had raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know that the faith that is through Jesus has given the man his perfect health in the presence of you all. Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning and we look at this passage of Scripture and we look at this sermon, it wasn't long, but it was a power. And Father, we pray that you will inject your power into every word this morning as we speak, as we listen, as we hear a message that comes through the Holy Spirit to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, here they are, they're gathered out of what I like to call shock and awe. Those mm. of you who remember the Gulf War, if you remember that term. Uh, our text says they were utterly astounded. And it's interesting that the word for astounded is an expansion on the word from last week. Uh, they were filled with wonder and amazement. Word wonder and the word here astounded, utterly astounded, are very similar. One just expands on the other. So he's kind of like pulling up the, the emotion. He's pulling on the emotion here. Uh, there's a growing excitement, or there seems to be a growing excitement here in the crowd. And uh, Peter, as I said before, Peter finds a good place for a sermon. You remember the old commercial, this is a good place for a stick up? <laughs> Remember that one? Okay, this is a good place for a sermon. Okay, and the apostles had to do nothing to draw the crowd into them. The crowd was coming because what they had just done. This was not a dog and pony show. It was not something they had planned to do. This was their reaction to what was happening in the crowd after they revealed <laughs> the man. As a matter of fact, the first thing they had to do was draw attention away from themselves. We have that in verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk. You know, there are an awful lot of preachers who are in it for the show. Okay? I hope that from this pulpit, whether I'm preaching, Sean is preaching, anybody else is preaching, you understand that we're here to display the power of God. Amen. This is not about us. Amen. Not at all about us. I certainly hope that comes through. And, and though I know people want to congratulate us after sermons, and, and that's fine. We appreciate that. But remember, it's God that gives the message. He's just using us as a vehicle and a vessel. But anyway, this was the setup for Peter's second sermon. And in this sermon, he weaves into it lessons of history, theology, and responsibility. And of course, we start at the beginning. We start with a lesson in history. And there's two parts of this. There's a lesson in, eh, I might better call it geography or geographical history, first of all. Solomon's portico was a portion of what's called the Court of the Gentiles in the temple. Mm. It was in this court that we know that Jesus spoke when he came, or he gathered people around him in John 10. And if you think about John 10, we see that Jesus came to the festival and that's been referenced before in this congregation when we have talked about Hanukkah. Jesus was there celebrating what wasn't known so much as Hanukkah then, but the festival of the dedication of the temple. And when that happened, he spoke in Solomon's 
uh, Solomon's colonnade or Solomon's porch, Solomon's temple, or whatever, whatever you want to call it. There are some scholars that think that this area, Solomon's portico, was left over from Solomon's temple. Not a lot of people are sure of this one, but it's at least interesting to bring this up because it provokes a little more of a history lesson. Solomon's temple was the first temple built. David helped assemble the material. Solomon built the temple. The Babylonians destroyed the temple. And then Cyrus, king of Persia, sent the people back after captivity to rebuild the temple. And then Herod built the temple. On top of that, he expanded what the temple was. Of all the things Herod was, yes, he was a madman, yes, he was a maniac, yes, he was a murderer, but he was also a marvelous engineer. And he built this into this marvelous edifice that we know as uh, the Second Temple. Okay? Uh, so it was probably in there that the disciples did most of their public meetings, or the apostles did most of their public meetings after the resurrection and after Pentecost. Until ultimately they would be driven out by the temple authorities. But we'll see a few chapters on in the in Acts. We'll see chapter 5, I think it is. We will see where that they're still meeting there. Ultimately they would get driven out. The second part of the history lesson is the more recent history where Peter addresses what's been going on. Really 33 years worth of history, but dominantly the last 90 days or so very short-term history. He addresses the people of the region. He says, men of Israel, which is a little more inclusive than his first sermon. He said, they're men of Jerusalem. This is a little more inclusive. And he starts out with the current situation, uh, the healing of a lame man, and their astonishment at the healing of a lame man. Well, let's back up a little bit here, and let's just talk about what had happened to Jesus First of all, it was their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of their fathers. And here Peter's speaking collectively. It's the God of their fathers who glorified Jesus. Okay? Then God glorified his son Jesus. Then the Jewish hierarchy had delivered Jesus over to the hands of Pilate and denied him, asking for the release of a murderer instead of Jesus. Implicit here is this massive separation between Jesus and his followers, Barabbas, the murderer, insurrectionist, let's call him a terrorist, that's essentially <laughs> what he was, okay? There's this massive separation between Jesus his, and his followers and Barabbas and his ilk. And who did the Jewish hierarchy want? They wanted Barabbas. We find that quite vividly played out for us in the 19th chapter of the book of John. <laughs> Pilate speaking to the crowd, he had already decided, as the text tells us, to release Jesus. You know, we think of Pilate as a terrible individual, a horrible human being, but there are segments of Christendom that reference him as St. Pilate because they believe he wanted to release Jesus. And from this text, we have to believe that to be true. Mm -hmm. So maybe we've been awfully unkind to Pilate over the years. I'm not going to go down that path this morning. But Pilate went out before the crowd and said, Shall I crucify your king? And what did they say? We have no king but Caesar. They essentially there sealed the doom and killed the author of life. And finally, God raised him from the dead. Now they're astonished. Now, Jesus was raised from the dead days before, weeks before. We don't really, well, we know that this was past Pentecost, so it's more than 50 days down the road. A couple months, who knows, 90 days, we don't have a real accurate time frame. 
But now they're astonished that the God who raised Jesus from the dead can heal a lame man. Now, if you can heal the dead, you can certainly raise a lame man. Okay? And there have been instances in the Old Testament where there would be no disagreement. Prophets raised people from the dead. Jesus himself had raised people from the dead. And now Jesus was three days. Lazarus was how many? Four. Four. You know what? Why those numbers are significant? <clears throat> because in Jewish tradition, in Jewish understanding, the soul didn't depart from the body until 24, depending on who you talk to, 24, 48, maybe 72, maybe 30 days, and you know, the other hours. Jesus, the soul didn't leave the body. So that's the Jewish thought process. And if you do some research, you'll find it in some segments of Judaism. It's still the thought process yet today. So there should be no problem with Jesus having been raised from the dead by his father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so this discourse moved from the history lesson into a lesson in theology. He takes the, the study into Jesus, the topic of Jesus, maybe we could better call this Christology, and, and gives some additional things to think about. First is the look at God glorifying his servant, Jesus. Here he makes the, the point of drawing the connection between Jesus and the one true God their God, collectively their God. They came to the temple to worship their God, the God of Israel, and the God of Jesus. Here's some nerd stuff for you. You know how I am. This is the place I gotta drop it in here. It says he was God's servant. And when it says servant, the underlying word is specific. I have very often Founded on the word doulos, which is a word for servant, also slave or bond servant. That those different meanings, that's considered what they call the semantic range. Well, the word that underlies this is pace, P-A-I-S, the way we transliterate it. And that has a semantic range that would include boy servant, boy, or child. But it certainly means servant. And that's significant because at this point in time, the average Jews were reading the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And that same word, pace, underlies a couple of key passages here. Behold, my servant, same underlying word in Isaiah. My servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the nations. We call that a prophetic or a messianic text. Isaiah 42, 1, also 52, 13. Behold my servant, same underlying word, shall act wisely, he shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. This crowd had been looking for, longing for, anticipating. What's the hymn we like to sing Christmas time? Come thou long expected Jesus, Come to set your people free. Yeah, that's this Jesus. So at this point in time, Peter's sermon would have started to cut right through to their hearts. We've seen this before. And then he goes on and he says he's the holy and righteous one. In the Jewish mind, Jewish Old Testament writings, non-biblical Hebraic writings of the day, uh, rabbinical writings, all these things would understand a holy one to mean only one thing, God himself. Only one thing. Righteous, well that term gets tossed around with a lot of other people, Enoch, Noah, some other teachers and rabbis referenced in some other writings. But the way this is put together in its original language, it makes holy and righteous essentially one real long word. The holy and righteous one. Can't separate the two. Only one person fills that bill. There's only one truly holy and true righteous person and that is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. God himself. 
Jesus even said it. I and the Father am one. So we know that Jesus is God. And here Peter is making it very, very clear this way. Now he changes, and we've already seen this slide before, but talks about the author of life. The underlying term, sometimes it's translated prince of life. The term was used in Greek literature historically to possibly mean the founder or protector of a city, commanders or other heroes from wartime. But here it takes a new dimension. Studying the lexicons and definitions of the words, it means having primacy of authority. Well, we understand that Jesus Christ had primacy of authority over life itself. Mm -hmm. We see it a couple places. John 1, 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Mm -hmm. We see it in Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews tells us, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Now they may have seen it as clearly as we do because we have the writings of John, we have the writings of whoever wrote the book of Hebrews. They may not have seen it quite that clearly, but they understood that only God was the creator. So they should have been able to connect the dots. Okay? In the beginning, God. God created the heavens and the earth. Everything there was God created, God created, God created. There was Really, no big in this one. They may also have seen this now because the resurrection is in view. As he was the one who led the way, he was the beginning of the author of this resurrection life. They may have seen that. I'm not going to guarantee that. They may well have seen that. But here's the thing we have to zero in on. Mm. It was faith in the name of Jesus, the Son of God, this Jesus we've been talking about, that had made the lame man whole. We have John 1.12 that helps us out a little bit. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. And here, we probably have to, we do have to ask the question, when it talks about the faith, faith in Jesus Christ, Whose faith was it? Was it the faith of Peter and John? Or was it the faith of the lame man? And this is where you can do a lot of scratching your head because some scholars say, oh, it was the faith of the lame man. Some scholars will say, well, oh, no, it was the faith of the, uh, the apostles, Peter and John. And then there's this other bunch of scholars, and I happen to agree with this middle bunch of scholars. Remember the multiple choice tests, A, B, we got a C choice here, both of the above. Okay. And, and here's how I get there. Okay. The apostles, this is where it started. The apostles had faith in Jesus in the name of Jesus because they had experienced Jesus. They had walked with Jesus for those years he was in his ministry, his active ministry. They had gone out, they had not only seen Jesus heal, but we can infer from the other pieces of the, the Gospels, they had done the healings themselves. They were going out and healing in the name of Jesus. So we can see that it is their faith. But then it seems like it's also the faith then of the one who was healed. He took on their faith. And we'll follow up on that in a little while. But it was faith that the lame man had based on the statement of Peter. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then we have a lesson in responsibility. This is pretty, sim pretty plain, pretty simple, and it's quite blunt. You killed him. Hmm. Can't say it any plainer than that. You killed him, you killed him, you killed him, you killed him, you killed him. Collectively in the crowd. Okay. Right in your face. They can't escape, escape the reality that their traditions, their religious and national leadership, had denied the very one they had been expecting. The very one they had been hoping for, looking forward to. They denied him and they sent him to the ugliest death ever. Death on the cross. 
And even though it was their denial of Jesus who did that, it was all within the sovereign plan of the Almighty God. And that's one of those paradoxical things that we have trouble sometimes wrapping our heads around. But God gives us responsibilities. This is where it was their responsibility. They killed the Son of God. So what's in this for me? Well, you know, there's a lot of things in here I can pull up that are the same or very similar to last week's message. I'm not going to go through them again because those of you who were here would remember them, I hope, and those of you who weren't here can find it and go back on Facebook or look at our, uh, our webpage and get it, whatever you'd like to do. And, and after a conversation I had the other day, maybe I should change this instead of what's in this for me. I might change it to something that's even worse to try to remember. What do, what do I do with this? Maybe that's the better question. You can look at it, this question that I throw out there on and off for the last couple of years. I'm not going to change it to something worse. But let's examine, first of all, our own history. We must remember that all of us are sinners. Earlier this morning, Stanley made the point of saying, if you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, now's the day to do it. I echo that. Now's the day to do it. We are all sinners. We're living in a fallen world, and like it or not, we are influenced by the culture that's all around us. All of us, on some level, hang on to things that are not proper for us and certainly not good for us just like the crowd did, hanging on to the teaching and the traditions of their elders. And they killed the author of life. All of us have been guilty at some point in time of rejecting Jesus. All of us have been guilty at some point in our life of shutting him out of at least some portion of our life. And when we shut him out of one portion of our life, we can begin shutting him out of more and more and more and more and more. How's it happen? It happens easily. You know what? I just don't feel like going to church this morning. Okay, that's good for one week. I'll, I'll, I'll even give you a Bible once in a while, okay? That's <laughs> fast. What? What happens after the second week and the third week and the second month and the third month? And before long, there's an empty pew because you and your family are no longer there. All of us do that. That's sin. And even though your sin has been paid for, we still need to go back and confess our sin, repent of our sin, and then turn around. Okay? Quite simply put, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I say this virtually every time I use this verse. Have sin, past tense. Fall short of the glory of God. That's not a one-time event. The way the language is structured there, that's a continual event. The only time you stop falling short of the glory of God is when you close your eyes and your final breath mm -hmm. you. That's the only time you stop falling short of the glory of God. When, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you enter into his glory. Our need is to continually recognize, confess, and repent of the sin. And that should influence our own theology. We have to start very simply again in Romans. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Once again, Jesus Christ our Lord, it's in his name we are healed of the demon of sin, the deadly penalty of sin, the wages of sin. Okay? We can back and look for a minute, just, just a minute, on um, this the healing. It was done in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Very specific. Peter wanted to be sure that that's the name by which he was healed, and people were fully aware of that name and the power that came with that name. And within that is the reality that we must be sure of who Jesus is. We've touched on this before. 
I mean, we've seen this morning that he was holy, righteous, the author of life. Mm -hmm. Within this, we have to understand that back then, things were formulating, and by the end of the first century and into the second century, we would start getting these heresies that would develop. You know, sometimes we have to ask the question, is this a heresy, or is it just wrong? I'll tell you this much for a measuring stick on this. Because there's places that, you know what, you're going to find something and you're going to come up to me and go, Pastor, you're wrong. And you, know, you could be right. I could be wrong. Okay. But one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to diminish the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Heresies diminish the person and work of Jesus Christ. <coughs> and that's something as you look around at things that are taught as Christian Listen to some guys talking the other night about Mormonism. Okay, many of us know Mormons. Many of them are great people. They make good neighbors. Jehovah's Witnesses, the same thing. But ask them who Jesus is. Hmm. Drill down on that. And you're going to find that he is not the Jesus that we find in the Bible. Hmm. That one you can take to the bank, folks. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is unique. He is the only Son of the living God. When you look at other, other cults that are out there that look good, produce good people, quote, good people, they don't look at Jesus as the only Son. There's always a reduction. You know, we can have a difference of opinion on a lot of things. We really can but we can't have a difference of opinion on the identity of Jesus Christ and Nazareth. In him and him alone, we must place our faith. We must know and be trusting in the right Jesus. A lot more to theology than that. A lot more of our own theologies than that. You can come in and talk to me about that anytime. I'm here every Monday afternoon. John's here every Wednesday afternoon. Uh, be happy to have that conversation with you. But before I end this whole thing, I really have to talk about this matter of perfect health. He was restored to perfect health, it says. That was granted per the text. I'm not going to disagree with the text. I do not disagree with the text of Scripture. I may not understand it, but I don't disagree with it. He was restored to perfect health. I don't know what perfect health looks like. I'm honest with you. I've always had something wrong with me. <laughs> okay? Uh, I'm telling the deacons beforehand, I finally found a reason I, I have a right eye that seems like I've had a fire hose running out of it lately. I finally found a reason behind that, and I'm fi hopefully fixing it. Okay? What's perfect health look like? I'll be happy to know, but I'm not going to know that until eternity. Amen. And, you know, I will pray for you. I will pray for whatever ails you. We will pray for you as a church for whatever ails you. But I, I don't expect me to touch you and say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you're healed. I mentioned that last week. It's not going to happen. I'm not an apostle. Sean and I together couldn't do that to you before you. We're not apostles. Maybe God will choose to heal you. Wonderful. And maybe not. But when we enter eternity, we will be healed. Mm -hmm. Just keep that in mind. Well, let's go now to our own responsibility, and with this I wrap it up. First of all, it was our sin that nailed him to the cross. It was yours, 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 mine that nailed him to the cross. We have to remember that. But remember a song saying as a young person in the in in uh, cantata, it wasn't my sin that nailed the Savior to the cross. It was his love that held him on the cross. We have to remember that. He died so that we could have life and life more abundantly. It was his work, our faith in that work, that saves us. And there again, we have to make that decision to trust the work he did, accept that free gift. I hope some of you have looked at our Facebook page. I posted about a three and a half minute clip of my favorite all time preacher, Alistair Bagg. I love listening to Alistair Bag, probably because I'm a Scotsman, only a little bit Irish. <laughs> okay. I love listening to Alistair Bag, and in that clip, 
He's talking about the thief on the cross. So when he gets to heaven, he wants to chase, it, chase him down and have a conversation with him and find out how things went for him. And he imagines the, the entrance committee, so to speak, at heaven's gate. And he says, well, did you do this? No. Did you go to Bible study? No. Did you get baptized? No. Did you get... No. 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 Well, what are you doing here? And the answer is very simple. The guy on the middle cross said I can come. And that and that alone, folks, gets us into heaven. Trusting the finished work of Jesus Christ. And we remember that every day because we still need that forgiveness daily when we sin. And yes, we sin every day. If we follow the pattern of the man that was healed in our narrative here this morning. This man went into the temple praising God. If you've been healed from the problem of sin, and if you're continually confessing your sins, repenting of your sins, if you've been healed of that, folks, how much do you go around glorifying God, praising God? And that's the lesson for this morning. If you're not a believer, you need to be a believer. We've made that clear, very clear throughout the whole lesson, the whole morning, actually. If you are a believer and you're constantly coming before the cross of Christ and confessing, what are you doing with your life? Are you glorifying God? Are you praising God in everything you do? Let's pray. Father, as we close this message, let us take to heart the fact that we need to be like that lame man. We need to be praising God. We need to understand the work of Jesus Christ and what it was. The healing that we receive through the work of Christ is so much greater than the healing that that lame man got. Yeah, he got up and walked and leaped. And that's wonderful. Mm. But Lord, we are healed of the power of sin in our lives. For that, no one, somebody here has never trusted in you, Lord. Never trusted in the work on the cross. Let it be this morning. And if not, if we haven't cleansed of sin, let us go back to the cross this morning. Mm. And repent of sin and confess before you of the sin. Move on, praising you in all you do. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. The guy in the middle says, I can come. It's Jesus telling him. from the cross. It's okay. I give you permission to be there. For those who have, who have known Christ as their Savior, are you ready for heaven? Are you ready? You know, that conversation came up quite a few years ago when I was down in the Bronx and I asked a couple that was about to get married Saving themselves for each other. What if you know that Christ is coming? Would you want Christ to come? Or would you want to get married before? And so on. And they had to think about it. <laughs> they had to think about it. Ah, you know, I want to enjoy my wife. I'm just about to get married to my wife or to my husband. What about Christ? What? Really? Are you ready? Are you ready to go? Think about it. Are you ready? Let us see. 136. Can you please take your email out and stand?
prayer for those who know you. For those who may not know you, who may be listening uh, later today or whenever, Father, come to them. Give them the assurance of your salvation because your son said they can have it. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name, and now we ask your blessing as we dismiss. We ask that you keep us safe until we return together. Ask your blessing on the time of food and fellowship that we're about to have. We thank you for all that get involved in the preparation of the service. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.